St George's Cathedral, Perth, Western Australia. This is part two of the lecture, The New Atheists, by Professor Keith Ward. So I want to make a dig big difference between two sorts of explanation, scientific and personal. So let's just spell out a little bit what that would be. A scientific explanation is like this. What you do is you try, first of all, to measure what you're talking about. If you're a scientist, you want to put a value on it. You want to put a measurement, uh, right? You, you want to get the temperature. You want to get the pressure. So you quantify. You put a value. You put a number on what you're talking about. You measure it. And then you experimentally control it. You put it into test situations and carry out experiments, and you predict what it's going to do next. And preferably in science, you try to make an equation. So as to say, if this happens, if X happens, if I drop a ball from the leaning tower of Pisa, it will fall at a certain rate to the ground. And so you make a mathematical equation saying exactly what that force of gravity will be. So it's a law in accordance with which things always happen in a regular way. So what you've got in a scientific explanation are three things. You've got, you can measure it, you can measure the values of the things you're looking at, you can make a regular uh, law which says what will happen every time from a given situation, and you carry out, you have experimental, public, testable confirmation of what happens. And when you've got that, you've got a good scientific explanation. Now, I believe you should push that as far as you can. You should seek for explanations in science as far as you can. There is nothing in religion which stops any investigation in science. In fact, the best science has been done by the most religious people, so why should there be anything that stops you doing that? But if you're talking about a personal explanation, that is different. In a personal explanation, you have these elements. First of all, uh, you have knowledge, awareness. If you explain, what I mean by a personal explanation is this. I ask the question, why did you come here tonight? You may be wondering, but why did you come here tonight? A personal explanation will say, well, you knew it was happening. You had the knowledge that it was happening. You evaluated the event. You thought, on the whole, I think it'll be interesting. I give it a positive value, better than watching whatever is on television. And so you evaluate it. And then you actually intend to get here. You set out. You say, I'm going to do that. So you, you set in motion a causal process which gets you here. And then... Hopefully you enjoy it, or at any rate, you experience it. Okay. So consciousness is very important to a personal explanation. See, in science, consciousness is not a relevant factor. Okay. You eliminate thinking about consciousness. Uh, you don't ask about it. You're looking at the objects of consciousness. You're just looking at objects. But in personal explanation, consciousness is essential. It's what you know, what you evaluate, what you'll experience, what you intend. So those are the elements of personal explanation, knowledge, evaluation, intention. And you say you've given a perfectly good personal explanation when you say, I came here tonight because I thought it would be interesting and I decided to come and I set out and I got here. And that's a personal explanation. You've answered the question, why did you come? And you haven't said anything about your electrons or you know, your, your actual chemical bits or whatever's going on. That's different. That would be a scientific explanation. And of course we get both. We can have both. We can have a scientific explanation and a personal explanation. No, no difficulty. They're different sorts of things. Well, I want to suggest to you that religion is about a personal explanation and science is obviously about scientific explanation. And you can have both. And they don't conflict. They don't contradict. They're different sorts of explanations. And the personal explanation is, well, the universe exists. Why does this universe exist? Because there is a, a supreme consciousness, a conscious reality, which has knowledge of every possible universe that could exist, which evaluates those universes, and which intends to create, to bring into existence one of them. And that's a personal explanation. You've answered the question. Why does the universe exist? Because God, knowing all possible universes that could exist, chose this one to exist for a good reason. What's the good reason? There's nothing difficult about that. The good reason is what a good reason is for any person. Namely, that it's valuable. It is worthwhile. It's valuable for God. God enjoys it. God creates the universe because God appreciates the beauty of the universe. So the general answer to why would a universe exist from a personal point of view 
is because it realizes forms of goodness, of value, of worthwhile existence, which otherwise would not exist. Let's just compare that with the many worlds theory of quantum physics for a moment. On the many worlds theory, all possible universes actually exist. On the God theory, God as a personal explanation of the universe, it's not true that all possible universes exist in reality, but they all do exist in the mind of God as possibilities. On the God hypothesis, God chooses one of them for the sake of the distinctive values that that universe contains. On the many worlds hypothesis, nobody chooses, they just all exist. Now, if you ask which of these is the more plausible theory, okay, one is a theory in physics, the other is not a theory in physics. It's about a personal explanation, which, as I've said, is not a scientific explanation, but it still is an explanation. Which is the better explanation? Well, I'm in no doubt at all that God is the much better explanation. Why? Because, well, first of all, the many worlds theory is morally unacceptable. The many worlds theory says every possible universe exists. Every possible universe exists. So there is a universe in which tonight, before I came to give this talk, I killed and ate the dean. That's a possible universe. It's a possible state of affairs. So if you say that universe actually exists, then every terrible universe that could ever be actually exists. And that is morally unacceptable. So you're going to have every possible universe, however good and however bad. I mean, this universe is bad enough. But for a believer in God, it is a creatable universe. It contains lots of bad things, true, but it also contains good things that couldn't exist without those bad things and that couldn't exist at all if the, this universe didn't exist. So at least this universe is a creatable universe. And remember that Christians believe that this universe is not the end of human lives that human lives continue beyond this universe so that although there is lots of pain and suffering in this universe for a Christian, we certainly believe that that pain and suffering will be used for good in a life beyond this. So you add that to the God hypothesis. If you think this universe is really just too bad to exist, that makes it not true that it's too bad to exist. It's a difficult, it's a tragic universe but it may uh, bring about forms of goodness which otherwise couldn't exist. So I think the God hypothesis is morally preferable to the hypothesis that every world, however terrible, has to exist. But let's not think about morality. Let's just think about probability. Which is more probable? That there is one conscious mind, the mind of God, which envisages all possible universes and creates one of them and brings it to good, is that more or less probable than the view that every possible universe actually exists? That's an infinite number of universes. I think most people would agree that the existence of any universe like this one is highly improbable. All right? So this universe with all its uh, laws and uh, the way that those laws integrate to form complex carbon-based beings like us, this universe is a highly improbable universe. That's, that's bound to be true. But of course, if there is a God who brings it into being for a purpose, then this universe wouldn't be highly improbable anymore. It would be highly probable that God would create a universe which contains forms of goodness and other beings who can be free and act creatively. That's not as improbable as a universe which just exists by chance. So the God-created universe is much more probable than the chance universe. More than that, however, it is much more probable, be careful about this one, it is much more probable that one improbable universe should exist than that an infinite number of improbable universes should exist. I mean, it's, that's pretty obvious when you think of it, right? So the many worlds theory is each universe is improbable, 
but they all exist. So you've got an infinite number of improbabilities multiplied. I mean, that just defeats the imagination, really. So it's obvious that the one God-created universe is much more probable than the many worlds theory, which is infinitely improbable. Okay? At least this universe is not infinitely prob improbable. It's just a bit unlikely without God. So if you're asking the question, which is more probable, a God-created universe or a chance universe, I think there's no competition. The God-created universe is more probable. So I think it's more sensible to be a theist, a believer in God, than not. Now, some people don't understand probability theory very well. Some of the new atheists in particular don't understand it very well, and they can't work this out. And one of the arguments that Richard Dawkins uses, he thinks it's a conclusive argument against God. It, it's the very opposite. His conclusive argument against God is this. If you've read the God delusion, I hate even to mention it, but there it is. If you've read that, you'll know he says there's one argument which uh, shows there isn't a God. And that argument is this, that this is a very complex and improbable universe. So if it has a creator, then that creator must be even more complex and improbable than the universe. So there are two axioms involved in this totally invalid argument. The two axioms are, first of all, that a complex entity like the universe, if it has a creator, must have a creator who is more complex than the universe. That's one axiom. And the other axiom is the more complex a thing is, the less probable it is, the less likely it is to exist. Both these axioms are almost certainly false. And let me just demonstrate that that is true. It's a complete proof. First of all, it's simply not true in mathematics that a complex entity needs to be brought about by a more complex entity. It's the opposite of the truth. In fact, Dawkins, who believes in the theory of evolution, himself believes that complex entities evolve from simple entities. So he himself refutes his own view. I mean, he thinks, yes, complicated things like human brains do evolve from very simple things like amoeba. So the complex can be brought about by the simple. Well, okay. So that refutes the axiom that a complex universe would have to be brought about by something even more complex. But the real thing about this is you can't compare the complexity of God with the complexity of the universe. The universe is complex in this sense, that it's made up of lots of parts. Let's call them atoms or electrons. We know that's complicated, but let's just say they're electrons. And the universe is made up of lots of electrons, and those electrons could be, in principle, taken apart, uh, so the universe could be decomposed into its constituent parts. The universe is complex, and it's made up of lots of parts stuck together in complicated ways. But God is not complex in that sense. God is, by definition, a cosmic consciousness, a cosmic mind. Consciousness, your consciousness, my consciousness, any consciousness, is not made up of separate parts stuck together. It can't be pulled apart into different bits. Consciousness is essentially unitary. What you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you think, everything is part of one experience that you're now having. And that experience is unitary. You can't put it apart. You can't compose it out of other things. And traditionally, theologians have said, uh, God is simple meaning that God is unitary, you know, God is not made up of bits. And so you can't say that God is more complex than the universe because you're talking about different sorts of things. The universe is complex because it's made up of lots of physical bits, but God is not made up of lots of physical bits. God is not physical at all. God is pure consciousness. So the argument that a complex universe must be made by some being more complex, but of the same sort, is completely false. God is not of the same sort, and God is not complicated in that sense. So the universe can have a unified consciousness, which is the source of its being. And in fact, quantum physicists, they might, without using the word God, would say this space-time does in fact uh, have an origin which is simpler than the universe. It's made of um, a balance of gravitational and inflationary energies and the basic quantum laws of the universe. And that's not like the universe, and it's not more complex. So that, 
the argument is just totally without any foundation. It's not even worrying for a theist. It doesn't even begin to work. And the other part of the argument, uh, which is that the more complex things are more improbable than simple things, well, that's not true either. Because this is where probability theory is very important. In probability theory, you can't have a probability without a reference class. Let me give you an example. There's, uh, you put 10 balls in a bag, nine white ones and one black one. You close the bag and you say, what's the probability that I'll pick? Uh, did I say 10 white ones? I can't remember. No. Ten, anyway, let's, let's start again. 10 white ones and one black. And you close the bag and you say, what's the probability of picking out a black ball? And you can say exactly what it is. It's one in 10 because you know how many balls there are, and you know how many black ones there are. So you know your reference class. You know the number of balls in the bag, and you know how many white ones and how many black ones there are, and then you can say what the probability is. With the lottery, the same sort of thing is true. People, mathematicians are employed to decide how much money they should give out in the lottery and how many numbers you'd need to have to make not many people win the lottery. So mathematics is used in the lottery, but mathematics is used because you do know roughly how many people will play and how much money you need to give out to make it worthwhile. Right? So you use mathematics, you use probability theory, but you know the data, you know how many people are involved, how much money is involved. Okay. So you now apply probability to the question, is God more or less probable than the universe? Okay. Now, Dawkins' argument is the universe is highly improbable, but God is even more improbable. But that's actually false. And the reason it's false is that if you're asking which is more probable, God or the universe, you don't have a reference class. You don't know how many balls there are in the bag, right? How many universes are there? You, know, you say, how likely is this universe? Well, if there are an infinite number of universes, then it's infinitely unlikely, presumably. But you really don't know how many universes. So you've got nothing to go on. How likely is God? You haven't got the slightest idea. You don't know what you're measuring it against. So the bottom line is this. And all probability theories agree with this. It's, it's not a question. It's a mathematical truth. It is that you cannot assess the probability of something existing when you have no idea of what things could exist. Right? And we have no idea of what things could exist. We don't know what sorts of other universes there could or could not be. We don't know whether God could or could not exist. We just don't know those things. So we can't assess the probability. So my conclusion is it's a complete, absolute, fundamental refutation of Dawkins' favorite argument. It is not the case that this universe, which is indeed very improbable on its own, taken uh, against the reference class of the other possible gravitational laws they could be. You've got a reference class. But this universe does not have to be brought into being by something which is of the same sort as it, physical, and which is more complicated than it. And the theory of evolution itself gives you an example of a case where that's not true. And secondly, you can't anyway assess the probability of God or the universe, so you cannot say God is more improbable than the universe. QED. What you can say is that this universe would be more likely to be the way it is if it had been created by a God. You can say that. Because it is very unlikely indeed that the laws of gravity, uh, the gravitational constant, Planck's constant, etc., the laws of mechanics and motion, very unlikely they would all have come together in the very precise way that is needed if it's to produce carbon-based beings like us. That's very unlikely. Uh, whereas if there was a god who decided to do this, then this universe would be very likely. So that, that's much better, obviously. So then you're left with God versus the universe. We've been there, done that. Uh, you can't assess those probabilities. Right? So there's no good argument against God in Dawkins' work at all. Right, so that's the bit about saying, look, there's an important difference between scientific explanation and personal explanation. Religion is actually concerned with personal explanation. That's a different sort of thing. And, of course, personal explanation will only work for you if you think that consciousness is an objective element of reality. It's not, uh, uh, it's not non-existent. It does exist. It's part of reality.
But I think most of us do think that, don't we? Daniel Dennett doesn't think that. He, th he thinks consciousness is reducible to movements of neurons in the brain. But I'm sure most of us don't think that. Let me try one little experiment with you. People who are materialists, and that's the argument. See, the argument about God is not an argument about whether people do stupid things in church. The argument about God is whether the ultimate nature of reality is materialistic or more like consciousness. Is this a spiritual universe or a material universe? That's the argument. Now, every great philosopher has been on the spiritual side, has said it's a spiritually based universe. Every quantum physicist would say, well, even if I don't believe that, it's a very good, reasonable theory. And I've tried to argue tonight that it's actually the most reasonable theory there is. My conclusion about that, in other words, is as follows. Believing in God is not irrational. It's the most rational belief there is. So people who oppose faith to reason have got it completely wrong. Faith is the reasonable option. If you don't believe that this universe is a rational, beautiful, elegant universe, you're setting yourself against the whole of science. And if you do believe the universe is like that, well, the simplest and most elegant and most beautiful way of conceiving that is to say it's the mind of God, which is intelligent and beautiful, which is bringing this universe into being. So I would say faith is supremely rational. And I regret the day anybody made up the expression uh, that faith is a leap beyond reason. I know exactly who said that. It was Søren Kierkegaard. Uh, and he was, like most people I'm talking about tonight, wrong. Right. <laughs> faith is not a leap beyond reason. Faith is precisely a trust in reason. If Christians have got something wrong, is that, that they're too reasonable. I mean, if you're an atheist, you ought to be saying, this universe is chaotic, it has no reason for being the way it is, it's accidental, it's an amazing thing that anything ever goes right at all. And you never know what's going to happen next. And it's all just one damn thing after another. No reason at all. But if you're a Christian, you'll say, of course, there's a reason for this universe. It is intelligently planned to bring about things which God considers to be good. And therefore, it is rationally constructed on rational laws, which rational minds can understand. And it's because of that that science works. Because science is the uncovering of the rational principles on which the universe works. So science and religion are the closest of friends. And it's a tragedy that some zoologists think this is not true. So that's a bit of a mystery, why that should be true. But there are other things, I suppose, still to mention. And uh, I suppose uh, one of them would be, is it possible to believe in God without any evidence? So let's move on to that. Is it possible to believe in God without evidence? You see, m most of my atheistic colleagues, and in Oxford I have quite a few atheistic colleagues, uh, would say, what's your evidence? And the question here is, well, evidence only works within a system that you already accept. If you've got the system set up, you can then ask for evidence within the system. But let, let me ask one or two philosophical questions, right? because this is a philosophical issue. Is there evidence for God? So my first question would be this. Is there evidence that anybody else is ever thinking about anything? Well, after starting off at the University of Wales, I went to the University of Oxford, and I was taught by somebody they called Freddie Eyre, A.J. Eyre. He was the great atheist. He was the Dawkins of, uh, you know, of the 50s. And Freddie Eyre didn't believe in God until, I might say, he died. Um, and when he died, he met God. And I, I know that's true because he came back to life again and said, my God, I've just met God. It's most disconcerting. I'm an atheist. He even read an article about it in the papers. <laughs> anyway, that's a story that we could go into. But uh, Freddie Eyre did have a rather disconcerting near-death experience. It didn't actually make him believe in God. It made him think twice about his philosophy, though. But A.J. Day was a great um, atheist. Uh, and uh, when he was teaching... He, he believed, I won't go into detail about this, but I don't want to get too boring, but he believed that um, you start 
in your knowledge of the world from what he calls sense data, that is colors, sounds, touches, things that you experience. You start from things in your immediate experience. And then you construct the physical world of independent objects out of those sense data. But if you look at other people, all you get is sense data of their bodies. So how do you know they've got any minds? I mean, you might all be robots for all I know. Or I might be a robot for all you know. Have you seen the film The Matrix? It's quite a good uh, illustration of this point. They're all actually not what they think they are. They've all, they're all being given illusory experiences by some machine. Okay. But how do we know that we're not plugged into some machine which is making us think that we're sitting here in Perth Cathedral? Well, we don't know. We just assume we're not. It's too complicated a theory to think about. But air seriously held that you, ha you had no evidence for other minds, that other people were having thoughts, right? So their thoughts are hidden from you. Let, let me take a specific example. So last night, I wonder if you had a dream. I bet some of you had a dream last night. Now, if I ask you what you dreamt about last night, I wouldn't be able to check that what you said was correct or not. I say... Did you dream last night? You tell me, yes, I dreamt I was in the Bahamas or somewhere where it doesn't rain as much as it does in Perth. And uh, then uh, I, I just had to believe you, really, because I couldn't ever check that you were right. I've got no way of testing that. I couldn't verify it. I couldn't show it was true. So Freddie Eyre, who believed in the verification principle, you must be able to verify everything, had big trouble with other people's dreams because he could never verify that they'd ever had any dreams. Now, the point is this. Here is something. I believe you dreamt last night, if you say you did, but I have no evidence for that. You're saying you dreamt is not evidence. It's just you're just saying you did. It's testimony, but it's not evidence. There is no evidence. You can't have any evidence. And in general, I'm telling you what I'm thinking now. I'm thinking out loud. Right? But if I thought to myself and I just sat in a corner, you could never get any evidence as to what I was thinking. You'd never know. If I was clever, I could make sure you'd never know. There are people who conceal their thoughts for the whole of their lives. They're called bankers. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so there are lots of ways in which you never really know what somebody else is thinking. But they perhaps do. So evidence is actually not always obtainable. It's not appropriate to ask for evidence for everything. And in particular, you can't get evidence for what's in other people's minds. Unless they express it. I mean, they can tell you, they can tell you what's in their mind, or they can perform some gestures which express what's in their mind. But if they don't, you'll never know what's in their mind. Well, now remember, if God is the supreme mind underlying the whole of physical reality, there couldn't be any evidence for what was in God's mind. Unless God said what was in God's mind, unless there was revelation, in other words, you would have no way of knowing what was in God's mind. So evidence is not actually appropriate here when you're talking about minds. And, of course, what the new atheists are thinking about when they're talking about evidence, they're thinking about uh, as though God was a physical thing. And that's, again, a total misrepresentation. We don't think God is a physical thing. When they refer to God as a fairy or as, as a sort of strange, sort of uh, ethereal being, uh, they're thinking, well, it, God's made of matter, but a very thin sort of matter. Or they're thinking, oh, Christians really think God's like God drawn by Michelangelo on the Sistine Chapel roof, all right? If any Christian thinks that, I wish they'd just go away and give up because God is nothing like that. And you couldn't read the Bible and think that anyway. God is not male. God doesn't have a beard. I mean, God is not representable. The first principle of the Bible is you shall not make any image of God at all. No image. Jesus is a complication. Let's leave him out just for tonight. Uh, but with regard to God, you could say you can't make an image of God. Some Christians have, and I think that's dreadful, really, really theologically obtuse. Uh, so, if there's no image of God, God, it's because God is a pure mind, and you can't make an image of a mind. What would you do? What would you begin to do? You, you can't do it. So that's why there can't be evidence. Let me push this just a little further. Let's go back to your dreams that you had last night. Not only can I not verify 
what you dreamt about last night. Neither can you. You had a dream, but you can't verify that you had it. You can't go back to it and say, oh yeah, that's the dream I had. You can't do that. You just remember it. Well, how do I know that you're right? How do you know that you're right? You could misremember it. But I have some philosopher friends who say people never dream at all. They just wake up thinking they dreamt. <laughs> if you believe that, you believe anything. But philosophers can believe anything, and they do, so there you are. So all you've got are you wake up thinking that you've dreamt, but you can't check that you did. And that's quite an important point. So here are some ordinary, every day, or at least every night, experiences that you have, that you have no evidence for, and that you cannot yourself check in any way. You just have to believe without evidence that you dreamt of something last night. So God's not the only thing that doesn't have evidence. There are lots and lots of things. No fact of history can be checked, right? Did Napoleon lose the Battle of Waterloo? My daughter went to a French school, and I assure you, she was told Napoleon did not lose the Battle of Waterloo. It was a victory which took the form of a tactical withdrawal. <laughs> but did Napoleon lose the Battle of Waterloo? Well, of course, you might have documents. In that sense, there could be evidence if you believe that the documents are authentic. But you can't actually check what happened in the past. You can't verify it. A.J. Ayer used to say, oh, you, you could in principle go back in the past and look, but that's ridiculous. We know you can't go back in the past. So no historical fact can be checked either. It can't be actually, you can't stand in front of it and say, I know that it's true. The point I'm making here is just it's, it's, it's wrong to ask for that sort of evidence for God. When God is pure mind underlying everything in the universe, you can't ask the question, well, what physical uh, thing could I see that is evidence for God, unless God intends it to be. God could intend there to be evidence of a sort, like the resurrection of Jesus, perhaps, something like that. But apart from that, uh, he wouldn't expect. So evidence is the wrong question. So I conclude, really, that what's wrong with the new atheists is they try to make God into a material thing, but a very thin material thing, and a very stupid material thing who's always making arbitrary decisions and deciding that when people ask for a car parking space, he may or may or not do it, depending on what he feels like at the time. But what you've got to think about God is get away from all those ideas and just say God is the mind, the consciousness, which is intelligent and beautiful and underlies the whole of this physical cosmos without which it would not exist. And if you go back to one of the greatest of all Christian theologians, Thomas Aquinas, that's what he says. He doesn't say God is a being who is just outside the universe and keeps interfering with it every now and again. He says God is being. The ex one expression he uses is essay suum subsistence, which you could translate as being itself. God is pure being. So all things have being, things like us, contingently. We, we receive being, we live, then we die. God alone is being. God is the ultimate principle of existence beyond every image. And Aquinas absolutely insisted that God is not a substance, is not a thing, is not a finite thing in or outside the universe. God is the conscious basis of the existence of everything in the universe. So, new atheists, should theists be concerned? Not in the slightest, except they should be concerned that people's view of religion has become so naive that they think the new atheists have a point. But the being that the new atheists criticize is not the God of Christianity or of Judaism or of Islam or of most Indian religions too because, as a matter of fact, most, the vast majority of Indian religions are monotheistic. And they would say, well, the different gods are all faces, different faces of the one supreme God. So I would think that one thing that counts against the arguments of the new atheist is that in fact the philosophical arguments for materialism upon which atheism is based are very weak. You know, I have many colleagues in philosophy. I'm on the council of the Royal Institute of Philosophy in England, so I know 
all the teaching professional philosophers there. And if, if you ask me how many materialist philosophers are there, the answer is I can count them on the fingers of two hands. The vast majority of philosophers are not materialists, do not think materialism is a very reasonable view to hold. So, of course, that's only philosophers, and I can just imagine what Richard Dawkins says about philosophers, uh, uh, people who sit around in armchairs with their eyes shut. But uh, still, uh, if you're thinking about intellectual argument, you know, philosophers are usually quite good at that. So not many materialists. More to the point, perhaps, not many physicists are materialists. I mean, you wouldn't find many quantum... You would find no quantum physicists who are materialists. And what they believe, they might not call God because they still think God is this arbitrary father figure in the sky, but it comes very close to that intelligent source of all physical reality. Also, the new atheists lack completely a historical sense of how religion has developed over many millennia uh, and how, of course, primitive forms of religion are very unlike present-day forms of religion. Obviously, they are. And in the Bible, you actually get the best record of a progress in religious understanding towards one view of God, which is very like the one I've tried to put forward tonight. Uh, so you get a development of that view. And, of course, again, what people like Dawkins do is take you back to the most primitive parts of the Bible and say, ah, that's what you really believe, a vicious tyrant who tells you to kill all the Amalekites. And what you have to say is, look, this was written in the Bronze Age. What were your ancestors doing in the Bronze Age? Um, you know, were they all highly intelligent, sophisticated people? And it developed. That few developed. And, and nobody can read the words of Jesus and think you ought to go around the world looking for the last Amalekite. You know, you'd say, no, those were primitive things that people believed then. But nobody, no Jew, no Christian is going to believe that now. No intelligent informed one anyway and no theologian somebody who's paid to try to understand the basis of the christian faith last point how can atheists like the new atheists preserve a sense of the dignity the moral worth of human personhood I don't really think they can. And I know that even Richard Dawkins is worried about that. There seems to be no real basis. You see, if there's a God, then God is an ideal which attracts you to love all creation and to love human beings as fellow persons who are able together to build communities which change each other as they live together. So morality has its basis in the purpose of God, that supreme cosmic mind, for creation. But if there is no God, if we are just the result of millions of accidents, if humanity is just something that nobody ever foresaw or intended and has no purpose and no point at all, why should we value human personhood? That's a really hard question. I don't think that the new atheists are immoral personally, what I think is they have no particular reason for being moral. And in that sense, I think it's very important to say that belief that this universe has a creative mind and therefore a creative purpose gives a basis for the unique dignity of human personality because after all, maybe it's true, we finite minds are minds made in the image of the infinite God. Thank you.